Am I on? I am on. Well, first off, uh, thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, everyone with Atheist Alliance of America for extending the, the invitation uh, and the opportunity to come out. Uh, thank you as well, Michael, for uh, helping to get the AV stuff set up so we can actually see my slides. Uh, if you see me ducking down, I've actually got my notes on my phone, so trying to keep long quotations off the slides so I'm not avoiding eye contact or anything like that. Uh, thank you also, Seth, for the introduction. I didn't know my life was that exciting or had that many adjectives or adverbs in it, but okay. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, presentation is called What the Christians Are Doing Effectively from a Movement Perspective. And essentially what we're going to start with is my personal story from going from fundamentalist Christian to professional atheist. Um, then I'm going to be talking about what the Christians are doing effectively. It's not necessarily what they're doing that's good or bad or right or wrong simply what they're doing that is effective uh, under the basic thesis that Christianity, like secularism or atheism or skepticism, is just another movement. And to the extent that they're doing things that are effective, uh, and those things are um, consistent with our values, we should be adopting them. We should be adopting them without shame. Uh, as I go through the different points of what I think the Christians are doing effectively, uh, I'll immediately follow by an analog to the secular movement, saying this is not something that makes sense for us because we value truth. Or, this is something that we should definitely adopt, and I'm urging everyone here to adopt. Uh, and then finally, at the end, a little bit of a recap and a call to action. Now, I will note that you will probably have heard several of these ideas before. In fact, if you haven't heard any of them before, I'm wondering what it is you're doing at an atheist convention. Uh, my goal is to present for everyone uh, at least a few new ideas, and perhaps present some old ideas through a new lens, which is useful. So, my story. Not surprisingly, my story can be segmented into the major sections of my life, early childhood, uh, high school, college, law school, marriage, and then, spoiler alert, post-marriage. <laughs> Go ahead and get started. Uh, I was raised uh, in Dayspring Church of God, that's Church of God Anderson, uh, which is a fundamentalist denomination of Christianity. Um, believed the Bible was the literal truth, Earth was 6,000 years old, um, kind of like the Pentecostals, only without the snakes. Um, the images up there are the two main pastors at the church. Uh, when I was in attendance from, goodness, three years old through high school. Um, and I actually thought about the Mitchell Burge and Terry Morgan recently when I was looking at a video on gay bullying. And I was trying to decide whether or not, you know, to post that or to talk about that. Um, because, you know, when I was raised, it was, you know, I, I was in the pews when the first civil unions uh, cases were coming out of Hawaii. And this was just apocalyptic. And, you know, as a society, we've really grown and advanced quite a bit uh, on the GLBT issues. We still have a fair amount of work to do, but we're definitely, uh, the, I feel the tide has turned. And I was like, okay, is this something that, you know, I really need to embrace, that I need to, you know, take a shot at Christianity over? And I did a little bit of research, and Dayspring Church of God is still operating. Mitchell Birch is still preaching in ex-urban Ohio. And so, you know, they haven't issued a public apology or retraction of their statements over the years. And so to me, that means there's still work to be done. So Camp Moringa was also an important part of my upbringing. This was a uh, religious camp that was affiliated with Dayspring Church of God. Uh, it's also still operational. That's something I pulled off of their Facebook page earlier in the day. Um, and you know, every summer for a week, two weeks, go up there, sing songs about Jesus, you know, get reinforced. You know, how important the Bible was, how important Jesus was, and how depraved the world was. And we need to, to stay isolated from that. We can't allow ourselves uh, to be corrupted. This is where I went to high school, uh, outside of Cincinnati. And my high school experience was important for several reasons. Uh, I was active in a group called Teens for Christ, which was an after-school Bible study group. Um, one of my biggest memories from that group was the, the outgoing senior president coming to me and saying, hey, I, I really want you to be leading the group next year. You know, I've got, I've got a lot of faith and joy, but, you know, we need a guy to run it. So, Neil, can you run the group next year? Um, very ha uh, heavily involved in marching band. We had a culture of prayer and religiousness, religiousness within the the marching band, we would pray before every performance, we would, you know, pray after, you know, we got suited up for a competition, and, you know, we really only had one atheist in the band, and he had really long hair and earrings, and so he was kind of fun to hang around, but not somebody to actually take seriously. Um, and something else that I really remember from high school is just feeling so bad for my classmates, because 
they didn't have the level of relationship with Jesus that I did. And, and I really hope that someday they could, they could be that close to God and they, they could have the joy that came with that. Also during high school, I uh, had a few crises, uh, specifically with my girlfriend. Uh, we were very attracted to each other and this was very inconsistent with what we had both been taught. Uh, and so thankfully we were able to uh, avoid that by breaking up with each other. Um, we got back together and then broke up again. Um, but uh, it was also you know, a really difficult time because um, she was having her own crisis of faith. And for me, this was just not something that I could process, that somebody could have doubts, that there could be some conclusion other than God and Jesus and what my pastors had been telling me all these years. Uh, and in fact, uh, during marching band, uh, I had my own crisis of faith, uh, November 15th, 1997. Uh, still remember the evening, we were just finishing up a marching band competition in Indianapolis, and I remember sitting down, you know, in the, in the bus seat and thinking, I don't feel anything. I, I, I don't have my connection with God. And I view this as a, tur as a potential turning point in my life. Because instead of saying, I really need to explore this, I need to, to understand what my options are. Instead, it was simply, well, I've got to find my faith. I've got to find the way to reconnect. You know, otherwise, am I going to end up in hell for all eternity? That's, let's, let's avoid that. Um, so high school is a very important part of my life. So one thing that I'm going to mention, this is actually the first time that I've mentioned this since joining the secular movement, is uh, my depression and loss of faith. And later on, I'm going to be talking about coming out. So I want to use this opportunity to come out as somebody who has suffered and occasionally still suffers from severe depression, from anxiety. Uh, it's very important to understand and accept who you are. And, and this is something that I haven't shared um, previously because I was always afraid, well, you know, what will donors think of me? Is this gonna impact my job? Um, and so what's so important, something that I, that I come back to uh, within this presentation is being honest with ourselves, being open and out. Uh, so I wanna take this opportunity to, to, to come clean on that, as it were, uh, and say that it's okay to be who you are. So next, what happened in my life was moving to Ohio State. And when I was at Ohio State, I joined Crusade. And similar to uh, some of my past uh, pastors, uh, that's Bacho Borjadze, he's the guy on the left. Um, he's the campus director for Ohio State. Uh, he is still there. Uh, in fact, I actually ran into him uh, in a coffee shop about two months ago uh, after joining the SSA. And I was like, this would be a very interesting conversation. Or I can get some work done. <laughs> so I decided to let that one go. Uh, the important parts of my time at Ohio State um, was just going to all these retreats, going to all of these different events where it's reinforcing that, um, you know, this is Christianity, this is Jesus, this is truth. We have to be remain separated from the world. Um, so after Crusade, uh, got involved in Faith Evangelical Free Church. That is Bradley Reith. Um, it's pixelated, but that particular photo really highlights Bradley. Uh, he is someone who just, you know, he, he lifts weights and it's all about we're going to be, you know, complete and total amazing men and we're going to be masculine and we're going to do manly stuff and we're going to be Navy SEALs for Christ and, and everything else. Um, and so it was very much just, just this whole culture of hyper-masculinity um, that caused it to be so jarring when I came into the secular community as I was starting to deconvert uh, and, and realizing all of these different co concepts about um, sexual relations, how, how the sexes interact with each other is just completely screwed up because of this, just such of this focus on masculinity. So after uh, graduation, I ended up going to law school. And in law school, as Seth mentioned, I had to start confronting these questions of evidence and burdens of proof. Um, and it was really difficult for me because I was so used to taking things on faith. And now I'm having to, to confront these issues like gay marriage and abortion. Uh, and deal with this concept of you have to bring forth some evidence. Yes, you can you know, regulate liberty and restrict activities. The government can do that under certain circumstances. And the government has the burden of proof. During this time, I uh, started dating a Christian in uh, Indianapolis. And we ended up getting married and moving to Indianapolis, where I finished up law school at uh, the Robert H. McKinney School of Law. Um, we got married. <laughs> uh, Bradley actually refused to marry us because we decided to move in together before we got married. We were not actually having sex. It was just, this is a pain in the butt to live with one of her friends, so I'm gonna sleep in a spare bedroom. And for Bradley, that was, you know, giving off the appearance of sin. And so therefore, you know, I, I can't take part in marrying you guys. So we got married, and after
after law school, I ended up picking up a book called The Grand Design by Stephen Hawking. And it was one of those things, hey, in high school I really enjoyed physics, this was a fun read, hey, there's something new from Stephen Hawking. And what really caused me to start questioning is that Hawking is just hammering away at this concept of the God of the Gaps. He opens each section by saying, here is a difficult situation, here's an unanswered question, here's how we used to answer it with religion, and here's the answer that we've come to with science. And he just does this over and over and over again. And so ultimately, that led me to say, I need to uh, critically re-examine my faith. If this is truth with a capital T, like I've been saying for the better part of 30 years, God should have nothing to worry about. So I got on Facebook and said, hey, atheist friends, all three of you, um, <laughs> hey, fundamentalist friends, what do you think are your best books, your best authors, your best arguments? I'll read them all. I'll read them side by side. And the conclusion I came to is, this is just silly. Um, there, there's just, you know, Christian apologetics is all about the possibility of it being true as opposed to the actual probabilities. So, started deconverting, and during that process, uh, this is my friend Ashley Holmes from Indianapolis. She was the first atheist that I actually had a real relationship with. Uh, and she's one of three people that I credit with my deconversion, uh, the other two being Greta Christina and John Loftus. I'll talk about some of their works throughout the presentation. But, um, just having that actual relationship and realizing that she doesn't eat babies and she doesn't have horns, uh, and that I could actually discuss uh, as opposed to debate works with her. So after considering both sides, uh, came to the conclusion that whatever else I was, I was not a Christian, um, and that was the catalyst of my marriage ending. Um, and on National Coming Out Day, uh, 2011, I announced on Facebook that I was in fact an atheist. As part of that process, uh, I ended up returning to Columbus, and uh, after working for another employer, ended up joining the Secular Student Alliance, where I am proud, happy and proud to uh, help undo some of the harm that I caused working in Crusade. So, bad for the other team now. So, our future presentation, what the Christians are doing effectively. I've actually got a nice long list here. I'm not going to read them out loud, but this is some of the coming attractions. Uh, anything in bold, I think, is, is especially important. Uh, in fact, I might go ahead and go through some of the other slides a little bit faster to focus in on those. So we'll start off with the artistic subculture of Christianity. Uh, this is a picture of Skillet. Uh, I believe that's at Ichthus. They are a uh, Christian hard rock band. They're absolutely phenomenal. I've seen them several times. Um, one of the things that I miss most about Christianity is actually being able to listen to the music and, and not feel guilty or weird or wondering what might have been. Um, but within Christianity, we've got this entire subculture of music and books and games and films, and, and it's possible to have a more or less culturally, aesthetically pleasing life without leaving the Christian ghetto, as uh, Bradley Reith would often call it. And so, um, the key is that a lot of this music has progressed to the point where it's actually competently produced. Uh, back in the late 80s, there was, you know, a, a starting of a Christian rock movement, but let's be honest, it kind of sucked. Um, but today, you know, there's, there's a lot of acts that are getting mainstream coverage, and this is, this is a big part of Christianity's success, because by engaging with a song, with a narrative, with a sweeping story, you avoid having to think too deeply. Um, you can internalize the pleasant feeling without actually saying, you know what, they're talking about executing and torturing somebody, and not in that order. This is, this is kind of disgusting. Um, it also allows you to avoid having to engage with the secular culture where you might actually meet people that have ideas that are worth embracing and finding out about because you've got your own little insular cultural community. Um, this matters um, because of the importance of feeling as a truth-finding mechanism within the Christian movement, having this concept of you can feel something, you can, you can really embrace it. And William Lane Craig, uh, who is the reason I give money to recovering from religion, um, his quote here that I've got is, the way we know Christianity is true is by the self-authenticating witness of God's Holy Spirit. So he goes on and says, it doesn't matter what the evidence is. Because I actually feel the Holy Spirit, that means that this is true. That's the end of the debate. And so that is something that makes Christianity effective within its community by saying, you don't have to look at the evidence. We've got other stuff that trumps evidence. Now, this is not to discount the importance of feelings. Uh, we definitely want to maximize human happiness, which is driven off of feelings. Um, but happiness is the desired output, uh, not a means of testing what is or is not true. Uh, and I care passionately about knowing what is or is not true. So the analog to the secular community is we don't have our own secular music industry, at least to the scale of the Christian uh, movement. Uh, what we have is we have a lot of little memes that are kind of cute and occasionally raise good points, and we've got some 
photos of Dawkins with quotes next to them, which are you know kind of inspiring, and I've got one later in the presentation. Um, but this is something that I'm starting to see as just an example. Um, Katie Hartman and Pretty uh, Rational is actually doing competently produced artwork that integrates with our values, uh, with, with our data. And so what we want to make certain that we're doing is we're taking ideas that are true and we're artfully presenting them so that people can engage with them both emotionally and intellectually. Uh, so I think that's something that's very important for the movement. There's also an authoritarian culture. Uh, this is Know What You Believe. Uh, these are books that Laura and I went through. Well, basically I taught and she listened and she thought that was absolutely fantastic. Um, but this entire concept of know what you believe, this book contains the stuff you believe, you just don't realize it yet. And so we've got this entire culture that is built around um, not about, you know, you, you may discover the broad strokes on your own, but you're being told what you believe. Um, there's a conservative talk radio station in Columbus that I occasionally listen to as a guilty pleasure called The Answer. And one of their taglines is, you know, when you need to know what to think about today's news, we're going to tell you what to think. At least they're honest about it. So it's not that, it's not argument, it's simply truth with a capital T. Uh, and apologetics is all about arguing that it's possible, not that it's probable. So this matters because the Christian movement does not encourage self-determination. Uh, they may be saying, well, you, know, you can find out what Christ has in store with for you, but it's not talking about, let's figure out if Christ is real or not. Um, it's an authoritarian claim followed by supporting evidence, not the other way around. Uh, it's all about how can we support this, not how can we falsify this. So thankfully, there's not an analog to this in the secular movement. We have no problem telling people that we think that they're full of crap. Um, and so we are evidence-based, and generally, even if our evidence is anecdotal, we'll at least call that out. We cite our sources. We are like the credible hawk, you know? You wouldn't like me when I am angry because I back up my range with peer-reviewed sources. All right, next up, the Bono effect. So uh, I was actually trying to see if I could find a citation for this story, and I couldn't find it. So this is like 10 years ago that I'm remembering this, where um, Bono had put together a book on, this was the actual meaning behind the lyrics of the U2 songs. And fans were like writing him and saying, you ruined the song because I thought you had just like written it just for me and I had this deep emotional connection to it and now I know that I was wrong. And so the motto effect as I defined it is that we've got all this wisdom from the Bible that are vague, flexible generalizations. Um, you don't see too many specific falsifiable claims. Now, you know, we've got Matthew 24, 34, verily I say unto you this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Um, so, you know, most of those people, in fact, I'd say all those people are dead. So, but generally you're dealing with vague and flexible. And so if you're able to apply it to your life, fantastic. It shows that um, Bono, or, or Jesus, or whomever, did in fact know you and care about you. Whereas if it doesn't actually apply, that just means that you misinterpreted it. You need to go talk to your pastor again. So, um, Something that's very similar to this when I was looking at, you know, for citations is we've even got this in, in uh, rationality on the Forer effect or the Barnum effect, which is the observation that individuals will give high accuracy ratings to descriptions of their personality that are supposedly are tailored specifically to, for them, but are in fact vague and general enough to apply to a wide range of people. And so we've got this, this feeling, this concept that, oh, this is tailored just for me because it's so vague. Um, the analog to the secular movement is I feel like we don't do a lot of storytelling in the secular movement. It's a lot more about data and evidence and arguments and such like that. Uh, I think storytelling is very important. That's why I took 15, 20 minutes telling my story at the very beginning of the presentation. Um, we just need to make certain that the, the data underlies the story rather than the story itself being the data. Or as the phrase I often use in the, often use in the office, it has the added benefit of being true. Read it is next up. <laughs> Originally, the section was titled Aggressive Breeding, um, but decided to tone it down just a little bit. So we've got some pretty specific Christian commands to go forth and multiply that, you know, the biblical exemplar of the woman is the culmination of uh, motherhood. Uh, and then the one section, a section there in Genesis 38 is the story of Onan who decided not to reproduce and instead spilled his seed on the ground and so he was executed by God because that's kind of a hobby of Yahweh. So breeding is something that's very important. 
Um, I was trying to find some, some real hard data on what the numbers are as far as the average number of children in, in, in Christian households versus secular households. And most of the surveys actually run it at the national level. So you're looking at the, the, the breeding or reproduction levels of a Christian nation or Islamic nation. Um, so unfortunately on this one all I've really got is anecdotes, which is that within the secular movement, a lot of people choose not to have kids. And that's very much the rarity within the Christian movement. Um, within there, there's this, this, this expectation and default that you will have children uh, unless you're infertile, and then you'll go adopt. And so why this matters is that children are about as close to a gimme as you're going to get uh, when it comes to propagating out your personal ideas and beliefs. Again, not saying that's good or bad, but it's effective. Um, you've got the power of the environment, you can influence their role models, and you also have desensit desensitization. Um, there's a picture I was thinking about putting in here but decided not to because it's pretty graphic where a few months ago uh, an artist put together a sculpture of Christ. So crown of thorns, the you know, complexion and everything else that we're used to, beaten up uh, as if crucified. But instead of crucifying this life-size sculpture, sculpture, the artist used a noose. And it's so jarring because we're used to seeing crucifixes and hospitals and everything else that the whole concept of somebody strung up on a cross actually really doesn't, doesn't, doesn't shake us because we're so used to seeing it. But when you change that, when you change that element, it really forces you to say, wow, this is an absolutely silly way to redeem somebody. Who came up with this? Oh, perhaps people in the Bronze Age. So that's something that is important with uh, breeding. Something else that I thought that was interesting with uh, an analog to the secular movement is when I was uh, reading, uh, actually listening to Sam Harris's The Moral Landscape, uh, he cites a study which says that most people think that they will be happier once they have children, you know, once they get past the, the diaper stage and everything else. And he's citing a study that says, actually, all in all, having kids is a net, is a net negative to happiness. And so, you know, we have to decide as a movement, do we want to try and breed? You know, do we want to try and keep up with the Christians? Or do we want to say this is going to, you know, impact our happiness? Happiness is kind of a big deal. And so we're going to recognize that this is something where we're at a disadvantage. So next is demonization of the other. Um, I'm sure you've all seen the little uh, cover of you know, The Atheist. It's like the B-movie uh, cover. I, I thought about putting that up, but that's from the 60s. Uh, this is something that was just very recent. And something that was so reinforced to me is that you know gays and heathens and the sexually promiscuous, they're going to destroy this country. Uh, this whole concept of you can't interact with these people because it's too dangerous. Uh, and so, you know, my first real relationship with an atheist wasn't until my late 20s. And, you know, this is just somebody that I was spending time with, playing D uh, Dungeons and Dragons with, playing board games with, and realizing, wow, she actually gives to charity and is normal and has some points that I should probably respond to. Um, additionally, we even have demonization of institutions that can challenge those beliefs, such as media and academia. Um, this is something, I've actually got a coffee mug of this in the office. Um, this is technically a parody. I didn't realize that until earlier today because when I first saw this, I was like, oh wow, this is, this is actually pretty spot on as far as uh, telling you know, children that are going out witnessing, if you find an atheist, you need to tell your pastor about them you know, because they're just, you need advanced witnessing techniques and they're going to try and trick you. So, the demonization matters because it makes it easier to avoid interacting with others. Uh, the Interfaith Youth Corps put out a campus religious and spiritual climates, climate survey recently, uh, and they said that informal engagement in interfaith activities lead to greater appreciation for minority groups, that'd be us, uh, and less for majority groups. And so breaking down that demonization and showing that we're real people, that we're out and we're also members of the community is very important. Uh, additionally, we don't need to demonize Christians. Um, yes, they have some very bad ideas, uh, but we don't necessarily need to make sweeping generalizations about them. Uh, and I think interfaith activities are extraordinarily important because uh, there are other people that have some very negative views about what atheists are. Uh, this is something that I'm actually really excited about at the SSA. Some of you may have seen the uh, Goats First Sheep uh, Interfaith Volleyball Tournament over the summer. Uh, we actually got, I talked with the artists, and so uh, we received the license to the images. So we're going to try and put out an activity packet. Uh, so that all the different uh, SSA groups can host their own volleyball tournament or dodgeball tournament or whatnot. So, looking forward to that. 
Uh, next up, we have an economic subculture. Uh, this is just an example of all the different business cards you can order that have ichthuses and other Christian symbols on them. Um, this is generally accepted. They have their own, the Christian blue pages is where you can find a Christian lawyer. And in fact, on Christian radio, they make jokes about the fact that it's a Christian lawyer. Um, you know, you have Christian counselors. Uh, Christians tend to trust their own. And so identifying as a Christian will actually help you economically. Uh, it reinforces the presence of Christians in the community, so you have business leaders that can provide additional role models. Uh, Christians can advance the movement by easily giving money to their own. Uh, also makes the purchaser feel good. Uh, within the secular movement, uh, we have the only example I can really think of is the Secular Therapist Project, um, where um, people can request a counselor that is focused on secular methods. Um, but even then, the contact and practice information is not in a public directory. You, you have to go through the Secular Therapist Project, then they make the, the um, referral offline. So there's still a social cost uh, to being an out secularist because of the demonization of the other that the Christians are using effectively. Uh, next up, we have familial language. Uh, this is actually a twofer with Band of Brothers in Christ, because it's also some military language, which is something else that we see often. And um, I assume most of you are familiar with Richard Dawkins' The Selfish Gene, but this concept of family, this concept of we are actually wired to make sacrifices for those that share our genetics, that are our family. Because if there is a 20% chance of mortality to us, but it has an absolute chance of saving my brother, who has half my DNA, from my genes, that's actually a net plus. I should have instincts to go help. And so within Christianity, it's always father this and brother this and sister that. And if you repeat a statement over and over again, you begin to internalize it. Um, it reinforces the sense of community and sense of outsiders. Uh, I had a former coworker. Uh, his trick was uh, not with repeating something, but if he was having a bad day, he would go into the restroom and he would smile in the mirror and he would hold it for 30 seconds. Because he's like, every time I do that, my brain gets tricked into thinking that I'm feeling better. So this whole concept of we're going to talk about being in the family and, and everything else is just reinforcing that. The only analog I could find of this, uh, these t-shirts which are a little hard to read, which show animals and say my 174th million, 614,000th cousin, 442,000 times removed. So we really don't, don't use, this, use this type of family language. We're much more focused on uh, building coalitions uh, or working together loosely. Herding cats, as it's sometimes called. Christianity also uses a focus on an oral medium. Um, so this kid is either beatboxing, preaching, or speaking in tongues. At least two out of three would be appropriate for church. Um, but you can, you can tell that immediately that that's what he's doing. He's, he's preaching. And Al Gore's The Assault on Reason, uh, he talks about how the oral medium is often focused on arousing emotion rather than data. Because you can't really drop a footnote in the middle of talking. Um, and talk radio, especially in television, is focused on we've got this 10, 15 minutes uh, stretch of attention. We need to see what we can arouse the passions of within that period of time. And so with storytelling, um, you often have storytelling within the oral medium. Uh, and so the story is often about a single person, which also leads to the identifiable victim effect, uh, the tendency to respond more strongly to a single person at risk rather than to a large group. And so we've got this focus on a medium that is very much about arousing emotion and is also used for storytelling, which is used to um, get people to, to take action. So within the secular movement, I think oral mediums are useful for introductions, outlines, multitasking. Um, but for serious scholarship, you generally need a written medium, which is why we own the internet, to quote J.T. Everard, because we're constantly writing. We're constantly being serious about our scholarship. All right, here's a big one in bold, financial commitment. Tithing is an expectation within the church, which is actually interesting because it's only mentioned in the Old Testament directly. New Testament, Jesus talks about it about as much as he does about gays and abortion and such like that. Um, the expectation is that it's on gross, not on net. Um, they often say if you're a first time guest here, do not feel obligated to give with the implication that if you've come a second time, you need to be putting something in the offering plate. Um, there's one church that I attended where they actually said we're going to have an offering and they had trained the church to cheer. It was, we're going to have an offering, and suddenly there's this huge round of applause from, the, from, 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 the, from the, um, those in the pews. And the reason for that is that they realized that a lot of this work takes money. Um, and so as a result, in 2012, there's a little over $100 billion going to religious institutions. Um, for comparison with the SSA, uh, Campus for Save for Christ is about 500 times larger than we, than we are. So you have a lot of money flowing in that can be used. This matters because full-time leaders have to eat, 
physical buildings have to be paid for, uh, and program services cost money. And something that I've seen oftentimes in the secular community is, you know, we talk about, oh, I'd save 10% by switching to atheism. And every time I see that, I'm like, yeah, that's kind of cute, but if we actually want to be able to do the same type of work as the Christian movement, we need to be able to pay people, such as hiring organizers. And specifically, there's, depending on how you count it, 50,000, 60,000, maybe even, you know, more than that, or Christian organizers in the United States. They just call them pastors. And what those pastors are doing are they're attracting like-minded individuals, they're forming a community, and they're giving them the opportunities to execute program services. And so in order to take collective action, we need to have economies of scale. And so we need to be able to uh, amass money and pay people so that we can organize and we can continue to grow. So nationally, we have maybe about a dozen full-time paid secular organizers at most. Um, there's a lot of volunteers, but there's an efficiency that you can get from somebody who's full-time. Next up, we've got infinite waiting. Uh, this is not an abstinence joke, um, but the concept of, thank you, <laughs> but, but this whole concept of we don't really weight uh, probabilities very well, the 1% doctrine, the idea that if we have a 1% threat of terrorism, we have to treat it as 100%. Um, this is someone, Martin Manley, who recently committed suicide. Uh, you may have seen his uh, website that he put up. But something that really struck me about him is that he's like, I believe this is wrong, but I'm going to tape a cross to my hand, and I'm going to say this specific prayer right before I kill myself. And so we can't grapple with the probability of hell, the possibility of hell very well. Uh, additionally, you know, this whole concept of you have eternal power coming to you. Um, you have no idea how liberating it is to believe that there's God, there's something supernatural that's backing you up. Um, for years, I believed that I had been created by God to practice copyright law, not something you hear every day. Um, and so this was a big part of my drive to be successful because I was like, God's going to make a way for me. You know, he, he created me to do this. Um, you know, and then there's also the whole concept of heaven. And, well, this is an infinite reward, so you definitely want to uh, get involved with that. Um, we have a little bit of an analog with the concept of, hey, this is your one life. Don't waste it. This is your own infinity, but it's a bit of a negative uh, as opposed to a positive infinity. Uh, there's also a meta narrative, uh, this concept that we can make sense of everything from the beginning of time to the end of time. We can answer the big questions. And this provides a feeling of security and purpose. Um, it's very effective. In law, we usually start with the big picture before we start drilling down into the details as far as the best interest of the child family law. Um, within the secular movement, we have evolution by natural selection, uh, which is providing a significant part of a naturalist narrative, uh, and it's the reason that it's attacked so hard uh, by Christianity. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and skip through, just because evidently my notes were longer than I was expecting. And Dave Silverman with his militaristic language. Okay, omniscience escape clause. Fantastic cartoon by the Saturday morning breakfast cereal. And, um, John Loftus called the, called, came up with this phrase, the omniscience escape clause, the idea that we can get out of anything that anyone has a complaint about uh, just by saying that, well, we can't understand God's ways. We can redefine language. So this is a very powerful tool that God can be good just because we don't understand why something that's obviously bad you know, is happening because of mysterious ways. Uh, this is classic confirmation bias. It turns Christianity into something that's not even wrong, to quote Greta Christina. So thankfully, we don't have any analogs of that uh, within the secular movement. Most of our other arguments, besides evolution, are falsifiable or rely on probabilities. When we don't have an answer, we admit it. So out and proud is next. I actually had a t-shirt like that in high school called Turner Burton, and I wore it about once a week. Yes. And so Christians are happy to claim themselves as a, as a persecuted minority, to happ happily to be out. Um, and so they use a variety of symbols to identify themselves publicly and signal themselves to fellow believers. Um, I think being out is very important because it creates a sense of identity. We've got research from the GLBT community that uh, being out significantly uh, gives a higher level of happiness. So as so long as it's safe, it's very important to be out. And we've got the Richard Dawkins Foundation with the Out Campaign. Uh, political engagement is very important uh, as it's something that the religious right does very well. Uh, I also think they use some dishonest rhetoric, but I'll leave that for a later time. Um, political engagement is very important because of the massive amount of money that's flowing to religious organizations. $82.5 billion by one estimate. 
Uh, and what we need is we need political action such as by the Secular Coalition for America. Uh, the powers of the default, that as John Loftus says, it's amazing how so many people looked out to being born to parents who happened to pick the right religion. Um, changing religion has very high social costs, and so we end up locking people into this default. Um, as far as some statistics, about two-thirds of children raised as Catholic will stay that way. Um, we're actually getting our own unaffiliated numbers up. Um, and the fact that we're building up a supporting movement is increasing our retention rates over time. So the analog within the secular movement would be my employer. Physical infrastructure, this is an important one. Where we've actually got churches, we actually have a physical space where you can organize, you can have flexibility of different programming options. If people relocate, they can easily find a new place to get plugged in. Uh, you can also advertise the location to newcomers. With Crusade, it's an obvious place to go fundraise, because in order to join staff with Crusade, you have to raise the money that it costs to hire you. There's about 350 thousand churches nationwide. And when we do the math on their operating budget, the SSA is about a block and a half worth of church. So that physical infrastructure is not to be underestimated. I'm only aware of about maybe a dozen different uh, physical infrastructure places within the secular movement. This is out in Phoenix. Positive branding is something that's important. Where the uh, Christian movement has the tagline of come as you are. And recently at the Great Lakes Atheist Convention, they were talking about, the, one of the opening people was talking about um, the branding that the GLBT movement had, which is, we're just like you. Whereas with an atheism, it's everything you know is wrong and you should change. And one of those is a little bit easier to sell. What I find interesting is that the Christian movement is also saying everything you know is wrong and you should change. But because they've been doing so many service projects over the years, uh, they have this positive branding, they have this positive feeling and so I think it's extraordinarily important for us as a movement to get out, bond, and do good works in the community, uh, such as Sir Rob Lane right now, who is raising money uh, for homelessness by being homeless, and the work of Foundation Beyond Belief. So I'm going to go ahead and skip through ritual. Costume party, American atheists. Important rituals. Uh, the whole concept of something being simple, easy, and wrong. Um, these arguments for God's existence, they rely upon not digging too, deep, too deeply. Uh, apologetics are all about possibilities, not probabilities. Um, and so this concept that things are difficult, so we're just not going to engage with them as a movement. Um, what I think is important for the secular movement is that uh, we do not have this problem. We are willing to engage with difficult questions. Uh, in fact, if you prove prevailing thoughts wrong, you get a Nobel Prize in science. So the last one before we wrap up is the youth focus. I do not know if this is a parody or not, but it was too cool not to use. Um, within the Christianity, they're very focused on training a child and the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. Um, so it's, it's all about getting them young, uh, getting them when they're not really able to engage. And this matters, first off, because you know it's essentially ideological blackmail, is going after somebody who is that young and saying, you need to believe this or else, uh, you're going to be tortured for all eternity. Um, why this matters is that if someone's going to get out of a religion, the high school and college years are the best opportunity for that. Uh, there was recently a Christian survey of SSA leaders that found that most of those uh, deconverted at ages 14 to 17. Um, because what you've got is you're giving, you're giving people the chance to get out before they form all these social connections, they get married, move to another city, build their life in reliance upon the religious network that they've built up. So, the call to action. Um, if it's safe, be out and proud. It's very important for us to identify ourselves, to build up the movement. Uh, we need to focus on youth. We need to ensure that we are politically engaged. Uh, we need to build a positive brand. Now, this is not necessarily exclusive with a more forceful and direct brand, but it's very important for us to be doing humanistic works and being out there and showing the Joe Kleins of the world that we do actually care about people. Uh, I think storytelling and art is very important as a means of conveying data-driven facts and I also believe that committing financially is very important because this allows us to hire organizers and this allows us to compete with the you know, quarter of a million or more uh, Christian organizers that are out there. Uh, it allows us to amplify everything else. Um, and I know that money is weird because I deal with money every day, asking people for money as the development director. And my thought is, you know, if the Christians can do it, then we can do it. And if being secular, atheist, humanist, etc. is a key part of your identity, then you should also be financially supporting the movement. 
Uh, now this may be in conjunction with other causes or it could be as your primary giving. The key is that you're giving at a level that makes you happy and proud because we're not going to be able to grow to the level and execute to the level that the Christians are if we're not able to hire organizers, build physical infrastructure, uh, and take advantage of their advantages. So thank you very much.